Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, we've just had our worship by conference call during the COVID-19 uh, uh, stay-at-home measures uh, on May 10th, Mother's Day. And um, I'm again doing the uh, Bible reading and the sermon for those who couldn't make it to that. Uh, last week, we looked at Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're going to continue that this week with verses 12 to 19. So, you know, in that first section that we read last week, it's all good news. Paul wishes the church in Philippi grace and peace. He thanks God for them, says how much he misses them, and states how much their prayers mean to him. Uh, this week, when we look at verses 12 to 19, we learn more about the context of the letter. So Paul is in prison. Uh, scholars who study such things believe that he is probably in prison in Rome, the capital city of the empire. We know enough about Paul's life to figure that he had preached the gospel and somehow been attacked by some resentful local people who were offended um, and eventually worked his way through various levels of the legal system and was transported to Rome for trial where he may have been sitting for a long time waiting. Um, even before I read the text, I'm going to tell you what my main point is. Then you can listen for it as we examine the text together. Um, we know that Paul has some opponents within the larger uh, group of Christians that are around. Uh, they probably weren't in the Philippians church. Uh, they may have been somewhere else, possibly in Rome itself. Here's where I think the core issue is. Paul's opponents are preaching a gospel of success. A gospel for winners. According to them, if you believe in Jesus, your life will be great. You will be rich and successful and you will have a nice house and a nice family or whatever the equivalent of those things was back in the first century. And because Paul was in prison, well, he was a loser. And losers shouldn't represent the gospel. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to read uh, verses 12 through 19 slowly and comment on each verse to show how it fits into uh, this idea. Verse 12. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. So he's correcting his opponents here. It's like, this thing that you think is shameful is actually spreading the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And all the people who are guarding me know it because they see how I live. Moreover, verse 14, most of the brothers and sisters, the other Christians, um, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. They see Paul's courage, his manner of life, and they want to do the same. They see that he's not discouraged by being in prison, and they say, oh, what could happen to us? If the Lord is with us, who can be against us, right? Now Paul begins a section in which he compares himself and his opponents. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition their own personal agenda. Or you can actually translate those words, they do it out of a sense of hostility. They're hostile. Not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment, you know, kind of with their words. But what does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way whether out of false motives or true. And in that, Paul says he rejoices. In other words, Paul, because he's more concerned 
about the good news of Jesus Christ than he is about all these image things. Thinks that it's good when somebody talks about Christ, even if their motives are wrong. They probably couldn't say that. Last part of 18 and 19, Paul says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for although, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And the Greek word there can also mean salvation. This thing that he's undergoing can actually prove to be beneficial. That, I think, is the message. Now, let's examine this idea that the gospel is only for winners, because you can, you can hear that in some circles today as well. That would mean that you need to think of yourself as a winner in order to be a Christian. And I don't see how that can fail or do anything other than take the focus off of the same Christ who was crucified and executed as a criminal. He died for our sins. He died in weakness because of our weakness. So how can the gospel only be for winners? So while Paul can rejoice as long as Christ is proclaimed, whether from bad motives or good, these Christians as winners would feel that the gospel can only be proclaimed by and for winners. Everyone else should just stay home. Furthermore, if you think of Christianity as being for winners, and if you think of yourself as a winner, and something goes wrong in your life, then you're in trouble. The only thing you can do is look around for someone else to blame. Maybe it's a rival Christian preacher like Paul. Or maybe you can look for even weirder ideas. Americans like to think of themselves as winners, too, but it's hard to feel like a winner in the midst of a pandemic. And some people are looking around for someone to blame. Who are the top choices? Well, the government comes first, of course. There are various stories circulating about how this is all just some kind of hoax perpetrated by our government, or maybe China, or maybe just one of the political parties doubtless not the one you're affiliated with. Please don't believe any of these stories. We are all in this together. We are doing the best we can to solve complex problems with incomplete information. I don't like all of our political leaders, but I hope and pray that even the ones I don't like are sincerely trying to work on our problems. Perhaps you noticed that this past week we had the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, one of the pivotal moments in World War II when our enemies in Europe surrendered. What a great reminder that it is possible for us to pull together as a country and pull together as a community of nations to solve common problems and overcome them together. Now, let's see, who else is being blamed for COVID-19? Cell phone towers. Some have been burned. Some employees have been severely harassed. Vans have been beat on. Please don't assault any telephone company employees from any carrier or vandalize any equipment. Um, we need our modern communication technology more today than ever before. Finally, there are some people who think that churches should ignore public health warnings and gather anyway. I don't believe this, and I don't think you do either. God is stronger than any disease, but we have a duty of love to our God and to our country to help prevent the spread of this virus. Christians have a long history of helping one another in times of flood, earthquake, fire, famine, drought, and we can certainly do it in this time of disease. We are helping 
all the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, and the rest of our community by practicing social distancing and wearing our masks when we go into buildings. So let's do our part. Paul started our passage by saying, what has happened to me has actually helped spread the gospel. And it can be that way for us too. When people see us doing our part, it helps them to step up and do their part. When people see that we are remaining calm with the peace of Christ in our hearts, it helps them to remain calm. When people see how we act as Christians, they may become curious and more open to the good news of the gospel. That is what happened with Paul when he was in prison, and that is what may happen with us. Finally, it is possible that in all of this, there is some silver lining, some way that God is working in our lives through this time of isolation, not just in spite of it, but through it. We shared in our worship time some ways in which people felt this. Um, people noticed that they were uh, able to spend more time with family in various ways. Uh, my wife and I are, uh, are, are having kind of a retirement tryout where we find out what it's like for us both to be kind of really close together all the time. And praise God, it's going really well. And um, so other people mentioned that they're getting more in touch with distant family through the modern technology and having more conversations with some of their family members. Somebody mentioned a couple of game nights and um, still others have found they have time for other things they always meant to do. Uh, some people spoke of, of having more time to read the Bible and to be in prayer. Um, and no doubt there are many other examples. I hope that you find much that you can be grateful for um, even through what, we're, what is happening, not in spite of it. Um, I wish you many blessings and a happy Mother's Day. Goodbye.